All right. Okay. Um, about a year ago, I did this presentation that kind of got a lot of people talking about the mobile web um, that who weren't talking about the mobile web before, and people got excited about it. And um, this is kind of continuing on from that. And one of the, the real challenges we've been looking at is there's all these devices coming out, and I will get to this in a second, but there's all these devices and diversity coming out, and designing for all of this is becoming a bit of a nightmare, as most of the speakers have alluded to already. Um, so most of you have noticed, if you are working in technology and in the web, everything's moving really, really fast these days. Um, it wasn't so long ago that I remember the best practices we all agreed upon in the mobile industry was to build separate mobile sites. So you'd have m.domain, um, mobile.domain, whatever. However, lately we're starting to revisit some old ideas. Um, there's an a article on a list apart from 2008 by Aaron Gustafson about progressive enhancement. And I think he's writing a book now, I think Jeremy was mentioning today. There's a chapter online available for free that's actually a really good explanation of how to do this and how to approach it. So all these ideas, which are actually a few years old, and actually I remember having conversations about progressive enhancement you know, probably about 10 years ago, they're all kind of coming back and they're actually much more meaningful today. And then we have some really lovely new ideas shaking things up a bit. And everybody's mentioned Ethan's article. I'll just do it again. Uh, if you haven't read it, please do. And um, of course, there's the elusive one web. That it, if I say one web, does everybody kind of know what I'm talking about, or do I need to explain? Okay, I see people nodding. So, so you know, it, it still beckons. We all kind of want that instead of having all these separate sites. And Steph and I are both really pragmatic devotees of, of this. We believe that we shouldn't be separating all these different URLs. And if you go to a site on one device, it should adapt to your device. And you shouldn't be redirected to you know, Android on, on one site and mobile on another and iPad on another. Uh, we need to bring some cohesion back to it. So um, you got to have a goal in life after all. But every so often we find we really need to keep an open mind and uh, challenge our long-held existing beliefs. So after we created that presentation last year, um, I had hoped actually to redo our site and kind of have a proof of concept of that at the very beginning um, when we actually did the talk. And that just never worked out. So it took a, a few months afterwards and we eventually posted this. And when we made it, we... Um, kind of did a bunch of little things, as, as little tests, does this work, does that work, where is it breaking, and, and you know, wh where do we want to kind of um, push things, and, and you know, what are the questions that need answering. Um, and we asked the question at the very top of it, which was, are we there yet? And that's obviously rhetorical, because no, there's just so many unanswered questions, and we knew that from the very beginning. So one of the questions we set out was right on the front page. What do you do with an image like that? Um, it's big, it's wide, and you've got lots of little detail in it, and you've got some text. Uh, the text probably shouldn't actually be in the image, but that's, uh, that's besides the point. You've got this image, and if you shrink it down, it then becomes unreadable. So automatically shrinking stuff down isn't really an ideal solution. Uh, so what we did is we kind of swapped in alternates. We created you know, uh, something that actually fit that, that device. Um, and it kind of changed the meaning slightly, possibly, but um, it actually provided a better experience. The problem is, we ended up having more and more and more and more devices. Um, so, what screen size do you make it for? You've got then you know you make it for 320. There'll be a device that's 360. Okay, you make a 361. There'll be a 380. There'll be a 420. So you just keep adding these, and then you've got the question of what do you do with um, the iPhone? So we have double density iPhone 4, the double density display. So then you have to include images optimized for that. So this just seemed kind of like the wrong way to go about it, because that was just going to be our job, was creating alternate images all the time. Then another thing was, what do you do with the markup? Um, you know, the, the one web idea, some people believe it served the same web or the same markup to every device. I'm not quite sure that's going to be feasible in reality. Um, what do you do with style sheets? We've got one here. This is a, a very well-known company, I'm not going to name who they are, um, and they have, it, they're serving this three-column.css. Well, 
on most mobile devices, you'll never actually need that. How do you rip those out? Uh, there's font support. Well, there's a lot of devices that don't support fonts. So actually loading the JavaScript to, do, to include them and then actually the fonts themselves, which the extra bandwidth might not be a, a good use of your resources. And then we've got some scripts. So we've got um, jQuery UI plugins. Well, again, on mobile, these aren't really applicable. And then um, we also have some device detection down here, which I absolutely love. So they've loaded all of this, and then they detect the device. So I don't know what they're hoping to do at that point. But uh, you know, so what do we do with that? And then we've got unsupported media formats as well. Um, somebody includes Flash. OK, what do you do with that on an iPhone? Um, that probably shouldn't even be in the market to begin with. And then you've got all these JavaScript files that haven't been combined, and you have a lot of HTTP requests happening. So that, that's probably not the best thing to serve to mobile either. Um, then you've got video formats. So here are the various codecs you could possibly, and, and the variations thereof, you could have to define to serve to, uh, MPEG-4, 3GP, Aug Vorbis, um, Speaks, Flack, and Theora. Um, and there's probably a few I've missed um, to uh, a number of devices. And you know, the idea behind this is you include all these, and the device picks the, the right one. But it says nothing about the available bandwidth or the size of the video that's going to be downloaded. So great, we've got the codec, but absolutely nothing else. Um, interesting. Ten years ago, uh, I had done a lot of work with QuickTime, and they had these things called reference movies. And uh, they were quite brilliant, because they allowed you to specify basically this, and also what bandwidth version would be required. So then we could tailor the video that got delivered based on something we could actually determine. Um, so again, that's from about ten years ago, roughly. If you do a search for QuickTime reference movies, you can read all about that. So, We'll just stay with video for a second. Um, this is a quote from John Dowdle uh, at Adobe. The biggest problem for handheld web video today um, seems to be pulling down a high bitrate HD file with extra pixels that are never going to display. So again, you've got your iPhone 4 or whatever, um, or regular iPhone or Android, and you pull down a 19 uh, or a, 10, a 1080p video. And um, most of those pixels aren't ever really going to render to the screen. You'll use just a subset of them. So um, Steph and I have been doing a bunch of brainstorming since this we, we put the site up, trying to tackle some of this stuff. And it kind of ranges from just a few simple ideas and prototypes to some obviously delusional ranting. Um, so I'm going to try and share a little bit of this dirty laundry with you right now. Uh, what this is, is a bunch of ideas we had on filtering and transformation of content automatically. So first off, I'm going to talk about DOM filters. So of course, you begin with your content. And then you probably want to get some idea of what you're actually going to be filtering for. So in this case, actually, we'd just use Warfel on the server. Um, you could use device detection uh, on the, or feature detection on the client, and I'll get into that in a minute. But in this case, we'll use Warfel, and we'll get the device ID, and that will return some data back about this particular device, uh, and we see the width is 240, so that gives some idea of how to adapt our content, at least for, just for that one parameter. So then we go back to our HTML, and we see, okay, let's now, uh, using some DOM library, whatever you want, uh, find the images with sources in them. So now we'll highlight all of those, keeping in mind that we're going to be delivering to a device that has a width of 240 pixels. And um, you know, we see a bunch of these, and there's one with 480. Well, we can probably shrink that down a bit. And there are these other ones, and they don't have widths, but, so maybe we'll have to go do a bit of digging and see what those are and if we need to replace them. So what we do is we select each image, and um, we take a look at the original, and then we see if there's any alternates that's been provided. Often we use just the suffix um, appended just before the actual file extension to give, kind of give some indication of what that image was destined for. Um, but you could put it in a database, do whatever you wanted with it. And um, then we just swap it out and uh, update the width and the height appropriate to the new image. And we do that for all of them. This was kind of a, a, a failed experiment. We use it still uh, when we need to filter images, 
but there's all these other fuzzier DOM elements. And um, you know, what do you do with uh, fig caption elements that might be related to an image? Where does that data go if you actually have to change the caption slightly to better reflect what's now in that image if you've had to change it? Uh, what about tables? Uh, you might, if you're going to a 480 screen and something was destined for a desktop, actually you're going to have to alter that table. So what do you do there? And um, even uh, Scott was just mentioning jQuery. Uh, you want different structures at different times, depending on the context you're going to be delivering it to or the, the device in the browser. So again, you might want to actually just alter those. And that was actually really difficult to try and filter um, just the way we were doing with these images. So we left that one. Uh, they have their uses, but they're not a, a solution. So then um, we decided back, I think this was November or something like that, um, media queries are kind of cool, so why don't we maybe look at using those on the server? They work well on the client, so let's go with that. And um, I was really into mustache templates at the time, uh, just brilliant little things. So we kind of devised this weird pseudo language, I don't know if you can read it, I just put a really small sample up here, um, that is basically a media query with a selector and then a template and basically a way of sort of transforming content from one area to another. And um, so it was a really kind of neat idea. I got very excited about it. And uh, I owe Stephen Hay a big apology, because he got all excited about it. And I, I was like, OK, I think it's working. And actually, it, it just was the wrong solution. Um, we hacked it together in PHP. It was far too slow to be usable on the server. Um, we um, almost reinvented the wheel. What we discovered when we were using Mustache and we were creating all these selectors and you know templates and all of a sudden, we were taking this slippery slope. It's like, fuck, we're re-implementing XSLT. So that just seemed like a really bad idea. Um, so actually, why don't we just revisit XSLT then? Hmm. By the way, I noticed a tweet from uh, Harloff, is this gentleman here, um, at mtdemo.mobi. Uh, you guys use uh, server-side media queries, apparently. Talk to me afterwards, please. <laughs> uh, very interested. So anyway, um, on to XSLT. So I actually, I, yeah, we stopped. Um, this is 99 bottles of beer in XSLT. Um, I don't ever want to see that. And I, I just, I tried. I just can't do it. And actually, I probably wouldn't have tried if it wasn't for finding a, um, a CMS by the name of Symphony, uh, which is PHP and XSLT, and it's fabulous. And I think there's some really great ideas there. I just can't stomach uh, the XSLT to actually work with it. Um, so some, somebody's beeping. <laughs> so um, the DOM filters, the server-side media queries, and revisiting XSLT. OK, well, I'm kind of out of ideas for the moment. So. We kind of came to accept that we, we're not going to get there, at least thinking that way. But we learned two things. Responsive design in one web, uh, on the mobile web, is really bloody difficult. And everything we believed about the web today is likely wrong. Uh, and I'll sort of get into that now. And in hindsight, the, the problem starts to become obvious. So in the beginning, we had computers. Uh, this is going back to about 1984 with the old Macintosh. And I know we had computers before that, but I'm just going to use Apple's line of products just for clarity here. Um, so I was a big fan of 64, uh, Commodore 64. Anyway, so we had this Macintosh back in 1984, and it had a screen size of 512 by 342 pixels, roughly. Black and white, lovely little device. And then. A few years later, uh, we came to expect more and more. So by 1998, we were up to the 1024 by 768 iMac devices. And those were lovely. And um, in 2007, actually, something that was much less than what we'd come to know before became much more important to us. And since then, um, we seem to have a, a lot less bigger devices and a lot more smaller devices in our lives. So all of these things here are, you know, 320, 240, 480, 768, which is kind of going back to 1998. We do have other screens 
going higher and higher. And those tend to be cinema, like big cinema displays, TVs, uh, public display billboards. But the devices that we tend to carry around with us and are, are very important to us tend to be actually much smaller. And it seems we're going to have a lot less, um, or a lot more less, on the horizon as we continue to make more portable devices that kind of fit our mobility needs. And again, all around 240 to roughly uh, 1024, and then you're kind of moving into TVs, and then eventually, again, into uh, public displays. So this has been mentioned by a few people. Um, current growth rates, web access by people on the move, uh, laptops and mobile devices, is likely to exceed uh, web access from desktop computers in the next five years. So again, we're going to have all these little devices that we're going to be toting around everywhere, and they're not going to be the large screens that we'd come to expect from Moore's Law. Um, and this is mainly because we're inherently constrained by our own human factors. We have fingers, we have eyes, we can only carry so much at a time, and um, there's a whole minority of report thing that does kind of makes, doesn't make a lot of sense from a, a UX point of view if you have to stand there for a while. So this kind of still presents us one, with one big problem. There's actually lots of problems, but in our minds, there's still one big one that we kind of need to solve before we can have some, some fun with this stuff. How the hell do we make our content meaningful in all these varied contexts? And there's two words here that I hate, and I'm kind of using them on purpose. One is content, and I'll get to that, but the first is context. And let me just first deal with what I mean by context. So it's a set of circumstances or facts that surround a particular event, situation, etc. Human beings are generally a very unpredictable lot. You're not going to know where they do, what, where they are, or what they're doing. Um, determining their actual context is going to be an impossible task. Uh, determining a meaningful device context is going to be a much simpler endeavor and actually ulti ultimately an opportunity for somebody. Um, and it all comes down to features and constraints, or features being stuff you know and constraints being stuff you didn't know. So screen size is a feature, but it's also a constraint when it's too small and it wasn't what you were expecting. Or um, you know, local storage is, is usually going to be a feature if it's there and a constraint if it's not. Um, so again, just kind of yin and yang and, and balancing one off the other, but um, having a good understanding of both features and constraints uh, in, in a certain context is going to actually help you design for it. And this gets back to the whole, well, how do we detect any of this? And we've got the, you know, the client, who's, who's here on the client side group? Feature detection via client side. Okay. Who's here server side? Okay, and, and everybody else is just undecided, or just you believe you need both? Both? Okay. Um, so the client is really great at telling me what features are actually supported on it when it's telling me the truth. There's a number of devices you can ask them, hey, do you support Canvas? And they'll say, yes, I do. And if you send it something to display a Canvas, it'll fall over. So you got to you know, do a little bit of testing and, and kind of maybe do a little bit of patching on the server to figure that out. Um, and then the server is good at actually going through reams of data and finding out, actually, what does this device have? Does it say what it's have? Uh, does it actually have what it really says it has? And um, what else can we kind of figure out about it from previous knowledge and tacit knowledge that we've already got? So I'm going to kind of explain how this works. The biggest problem we're going to have for a while it's first load. It's kind of like cold starting your car. Um, you're not really running at, at first. So you've got the client and the server. And the client makes a request to the server. We've got this initial request comes up. And the server says, yeah, yeah, uh, this isn't really working for me. You, I've got a whole bunch of HTML, CSS, JavaScript. I can send it all down to you. I really have no idea what you want. So that's where you're going to actually use a device database such as Werfel. There's also Device Atlas, and I'm sure there's others. But I'll just use Werfel for convenience here. And there's APIs for PHP and Java. So you query Werfel, you ask it to give you a return an ID of that device. And 
it returns some information of which, in this instance, we're worried about the width. And it turns out to be 320 pixels. So we actually create a little profile and we stash that away in a cookie. And um, we take that information. We can actually use that. So then we look back at what we've got to send. And it's like, OK, 320 pixels. Well, I probably can actually shrink my images right off the bat. I actually might be able to do something. The, the width isn't going to tell me whether I can use fonts or not. It's not going to tell me whether I can use JavaScript. But I can take some tacit knowledge of what I already know about devices that are usually 320 pixels wide and make some guesses. Um, so you include only, the, include only the stuff that actually makes sense for the device you're running to. So also be sure to compress it. Um, send down as little as you can. So then that gets down to the device. The device opens it up and then runs a little JavaScript. And you do your, detect feature, uh, your feature detection right there. Only the stuff that is important. Don't try and detect every feature. Um, only the stuff that's actually going to be used by your project. So you, you know, whether it's going to be Canvas, uh, video, Flash, whatever, detect those. Update the profile, so chunk a bunch more of those into the cookie. And I love the H.264 one that's always returned, probably. Um, that's just, <laughs> yes, probably it's going to work. Um, anyway, so you, you update the cookie, and on subsequent requests, you return that back to the server with it. And then you sync it. And now you've got that same device profile, both client and server. And this would actually be a really good time to take that profile and what you know, you probably gathered it through the user agent string, and stash it away. And you can say, OK, this is an iPhone. This is the features I've got that I was looking for. Yeah, I'll keep that, and I'll, I'll deal with it later, and maybe do some little data mining and, and see if I can discern any other little nuggets. Or maybe there's some new devices that come on the market, and you can start tracking them that way to see what features they have. And that way, next time somebody comes with that device and a cold start, or the first load, you actually don't need to wait for that entire round trip. You can actually get probably 80% of the way there right from the first load. Um, there's some sample code of this uh, at GitHub. And um, I'm also farting around with a, a little sort of pseudo database thing um, that builds profiles based on little bits of the UA string rather than taking an entire UA string to match against a certain record and then returning a profile based on that. We just basically look for little chunks. And it's all built on tacit knowledge we've had for ages of what's important, um, what can we discern from a certain device. And then it'll build a profile from maybe five or six different pieces of the UA string based on these, these fragments. And um, it's just smaller. It's not having to load 12 megs uh, in Werfel. And, um, could, could be easier to maintain long term, but I'm just hacking around with it if you're interested. But you can easily take the code that's there and patch in Warful and you'd be fine. Um, it's also important to think that you're not limited to just what the features that you can detect are. Make up your own. Um, if, you, if you can detect that the browser's lame, it, it's really a bad browser, you don't want to support it. Instead of figuring out all the features that might make a browser lame, just wrap them all in there and say, OK, I've detected for no Canvas support. It doesn't support my fonts. It's lame. I'll just label it that way. That's it. And it's less info that you'd have to put into the cookie to transmit back and forth. Um, and there's lots and lots of things uh, that you can detect. Um, if it's uh, got a touch object, which it may report false at times, um, you might be able to discern if it's a tablet. Um, again, if it's got H.264, probably. Um, font face, WebGL, etc. So really, what you're left with is something that looks like a little DNA profile of the browser and the device it's requesting. So, what are the pieces that are actually relevant to you? And what are your features and constraints now that you're going to be designing with? So that's the end of the detour. So from this point, um, this is going to get a little weird. Um, <laughs> the significant problems we face cannot be solved at the same level of thinking we were at when we created them. And I'm going to kind of jump back a, a few years here. Um, so. And this is, this is a weird one. Uh, what if what is actual is actually not normal? So what is, if what we have today isn't what we should actually have today? So this is a, a little bit of cerebral gymnastics here. 
how would the web be different it, and our perception of it if history, and Steve in this case, had given us the iPhone first? And we'd have a nice curve that went straight up without that blip in 2007 taking us off in a different direction. And this is the one I've been really worried about. What would happen if we designed content? You're beeping. The way, uh, in a similar man manner to the way we design software and applications. Could we design content that adapts to 40,000 contexts? And um, I think this has been mentioned here as well. This is the MIT logo that was recently updated. And um, it's a generative design, and they can create 40,000 variations of it, which I thought was quite cool. That's kind of the question that I, we kind of posed to ourselves and started thinking about this a few months back. And um, this has been a bugbear for us for a while. The way most of us build sites today is we look at the containers. We go out and we get WordPress or Drupal or maybe Symfony or, or whatever your favorite CMS is. And um, then we create some templates. And the page templates tend to dominate the content. We have this huge amount of navigation and ads and more ads. And we, of course, put our content there. And basically, all of that is to well, make money and keep us on the site longer, clicking through various pieces. It has nothing to do with the content. And again, some people are going to say, oh, I make apps, I don't make content. We'll get to that in a bit. But if this is your product, that kind of seems like an odd thing to do. Um, and the way we author for all of this is we pull up something like this. It's, it's lovely, it's wonderful, and it has one box, and you put your content you put your content in that. Um, so now you've got your content, you've, you've shoved it into this sandbox, and the context is completely irrelevant. Um, you've just typed anything, you've added images, whatever. You have no idea if this content was actually designed to go mobile, desktop, um, to a TV, to a public display. Um, maybe it, it's going to go to something without a display, but there's nothing there to help you. So then you're going to have to filter it. And when you have content that has no idea of its context, basically you just do the best you can and you flow it in. And in this case, I'm using, um, I'll get to that in a second. But again, they didn't even try to adapt this one to a mobile device, they just let it flow. Um, for this presentation, I'm going to actually use some of, or one piece of Tommy Ohonen's content um, that everybody should read anyway. But um, his site's great. I don't, how many people have read Tommy Ohonen already? few people. If you don't, you should check him out. He's got a lot of really great stuff to say um, and uh, just a really great uh, view of the industry. So this is Mr. Brian Fling. He um, made this point the other day that I couldn't agree with more. There is no such thing as a mobile-friendly CMS. Um, again, we're taking all this content and cramming it into one context and then trying to filter it. And what's happening is we're treating our content as rubbish with absolutely no value. And this is our assets. This is what we're producing to actually entice people to come to our sites and click through those banner ads and everything else. But we're not doing anything with this content. Um, it, it's, it's become secondary to everything else. That just seems wrong. Um, and it's so wrong, it provides really great opportunities for everybody else, or at least a, a subset of everybody else. Anybody use these? <laughs> anybody, uh, anybody prefer just to you know, read the, the blog articles they, they enjoy on the actual sites themselves these days? <laughs> OK, so really, and, and this one here, readable and, and reader in Safari, I've kind of combined those. They're web-based. Uh, one is actually in Apple Safari, and, and the other one's a web service. Um, so basically, we're taking all these services are now taking this and automatically turning it into this. It's a, a lovely experience. 
And this when you actually get to the content, we've got lovely typography here. It feels, it feels good to read this. It's simple. It's, it's got all that clutter out of the way. Um, and oh, ah, this is even back in a browser. So we're using another site or another app on the web to read another site or app on the web. That's, that's great. I absolutely love that. Um, so yeah. And this is even better. So now this site's offering a way to customize the other site. So I can actually choose my headers and my font family and my size and pixels. And this is great. I have so much control over somebody else's content now. We have to be better uh, to, to be able to do significantly better than screen scrapers. This is silly. But Does anybody have any knives? Sharp objects? I just want to make sure nobody's going to hurl anything. Can we do significantly better than a PDF? These are, I spent the past month or two kind of digging through these and having lots of fun with them. And, and they're, they're absolutely fascinating. Years ago, I um, did some work as a graphic designer, probably oh, close to maybe 20 years ago. And my boss made me learn PostScript, and I hated him for it. But it was an interesting thing, like to actually design graphics using a programming language. And he made me do it because it was better for the image setter. So, um, so anyway, there, we've got this fascinating little technology in PDF that is a database. Um, part of it's a database here. And it has all of our text and paths and annotations. And it's all chunked into certain pages. Um, and we've got types. We've got Booleans, numbers, strings, names, arrays, dictionaries, streams, and null values. Um, so in each PDF document, we have this amazing little database. And then you combine that with PostScript. And now you've got a programming language <coughs> that has um, functions and routine calls. And we even have a context at the very top. It'll give us a bounding box of you know, 0, 0, and whatever other dimension we're going to use. Ouch. Did I do that? Um, so PDF it was the mic? OK. Is the mic on? Yeah. OK. So PDF was really designed to deliver one single context everywhere, and regardless of device. It was made for printers, um, and we've used it for screens, and, or PostScript was made for printers. Um, Apple went and used it for screens years ago, and it faithfully renders everywhere. But it's designed for one context, typically. However, it will scale, so you get that benefit as well. So in each PDF now, we actually have a database and an application. That's kind of remarkable. That's actually more than we have on a lot of websites. Um, but the problem with PDF is it's not terribly adaptive. You go and rotate your screen, and it just stays the way it was. The web wasn't designed to be constrained to one context. So we should probably stop imposing arbitrary context on our content. We design things for 960 grid. We design things for 1024. We design it for 360, for 320. Why isn't why aren't we just letting go a little bit and letting things move and adapt as they're going to? That's the way it was designed. Web design is software design. It's not print, it's not print design. It's not page design. Um, you need to take the device context into consideration. You need to take your features into, and constraints into consideration when you make a design. And consider your data and the application or view controllers that are actually going to be displaying that data to the to the output device. And that always won't be a display. You could have audio. You could have, it could be going to print. Um, and we've got Apple actually now with devices. You can print from your iPad or your, your iPhone. Do we always want the same content that you're viewing to be printed exactly as it is on your iPhone? Or do we want to adapt to the printer context? Um, often you'll want that document to be more formatted for that page it's going to be displayed on. Down at the bottom here, I've got two little projects, open source projects um, mentioned. One being CouchDB, which is this thing that just captivates me. It's 
it, it runs on mobile devices and it runs on servers. And um, basically, it, it's a database with JavaScript. It, it's, a, it's a document centric database, to be honest, which is basically JSON. Um, and it's some JavaScript that creates views, so you can actually render your content to different views. And then you can actually write apps inside of it, so you can transform this. And it, it's, I don't completely know how I want to use it yet, but there's some little bits of brilliance going on there that I look back to PDF and it's like, okay, this could actually be really useful to use. And Node.js is another one. It doesn't really have the, the um, data storage behind it, but it's got this lovely way of kind of manipulating things and bringing things in and moving them around. Um, that isn't going to sort of block and hang like Apache or PHP might while you sit there and filter the DOM. So welcome to a brave new hello world. Content as applications. Um, it should be kind of obvious that we're really need to start with the content. Typography really matters. Uh, you may not care, uh, but your users and your competitors sure do. Uh, Instapaper and Flipboard and all of these things what they're basically doing is taking your content and applying some basic typography to make it readable again and stripping out all the, cr all the crap. Um, so don't be afraid to steal their ideas. Um, they've got this lovely idea of preferences. Why don't our sites have preferences? Why can't I say, okay, when I'm on a mobile device, I want you to do this. When I want to read it this way, do that. Why can't I set that? Um, that might even be something I, I might pay for to be able to do that. Um, this was another one that I loved when I, I finally got around to playing with it. It's called SAS, and if you're on Node.js, there's a pro uh, project or um, sort of a, a side app called Stylus that does very similar things. And um, we don't currently have expressions in CSS now, um, or any way of adding any real logic beyond, beyond basic Booleans in, um, in media queries. And this is, allows us to actually add variables and operate on those variables and add expressions and constraints. Um, for instance, up at the very top, we have a min and max width uh, defined as variables. So we can actually change those really quickly at any time. Um, we have columns that are all declared uh, using M's, so it's just going to be a percentage size. And down here, we even have really, really simple expressions. Um, column margin divided by two. Okay, well, actually, we've just made that very, very relative to a whole bunch of things. Um, so, and then, of course, there's even lovely things like um, RGBA or, or color um, filters where you can actually say, make this darker, lighter, whatever, and it'll do that math for you. Um, so, really, it provides you a chance to think relative Embrace uncertainty, because you're not going to know the size of the device and all its capabilities, and start to express yourself beyond just what you could do in Photoshop. So I've often heard a picture's worth a thousand words. There's one. Um, you're going to need to adapt that to go to mobile devices. There's a, a lovely um, uh, product or web service from the folks at Sencha called Tiny Source, and it will allow you to basically really quickly and easily adapt your images. It does all the contextual stuff for you, so basically point an image at it, say, go fix it for whatever device happens to be um, requesting it, and it'll serve an appropriate one size to that device. Um, really easy, you can do it in minutes, and it doesn't require you to do any programming. Um, if you want to program and do it yourself, I have 15 minutes. Okay, I should, that should be enough. Um, there's image magic, um, Python imaging libraries, and everything else, and you can roll your own. Um, anyway, images can also be applications. Um, basically, this big bitmap is a whole bunch of data. We can manipulate that. And actually, this here, if, if it's in vector, we can manipulate that too. Um, and if, you know, using HTML5, you can do it in Canvas. And actually, Node even supports Canvas. Or, of course, you can use any bitmap libraries, such as Python, uh, Imaging Library, or Image Magic. And SVG is just XML. And these images can then adapt based on constraints you define, um, you know, how far from one edge and, and how much padding would it need between another element. And you just render that um, sort of whenever you need it. And it adapts to changes in context, uh, depending on the device you're requesting it. 
So, quick aside rant. Um, I don't really have time to get into this. There's lots of infographics going around right now. They're lovely, they're very visual, they're a great way of explaining things. Um, why are we building them as JPEGs or, or pings? Um, if they're data, why don't we leave the data there and actually start designing in, in web technologies that we can actually do something with? These, they're kind of useless the way they are, and actually, you know, they're, they're love. I don't want to say useless; they're lovely, but we could do so much more with them. Um, Paul Roger, uh, there's a link down here. Um, I'll try and get the slides up later. Uh, he's sort of basically said uh, or put out a challenge to designers to. Um, start doing them in HTML and CSS and SVG rather than just using um, uh, Photoshop or Illustrator. So what about all this text? And I'm going to go a bit quicker now. So, oh, actually, we'll even deal with this little bit of text. It's, it's actually much shorter. Well, you, you need to make it useful and somewhat meaningful. So you're going to usually add a structure to enable manipulation of that text or data. And here, what Twitter's done is quite brilliant. You have an identifier using the at symbol, so that adds a little bit of structure. Uh, you have the hashtag, which actually signifies a tag. And then, of course, you've got the HTTP colon slash slash, which is a, a URL identifier. So all of a sudden, we now have three bits of data out of this because of a little bit of structure. And for what it's worth, actually, we have the at PPK at the bottom, too. And we even have the colon between two numbers. And that could be another piece of structured data we could pull out. So. This all becomes recognizable, and we can actually start to manipulate this in other ways to present more meaning to people viewing this content. And this can all be done through microformats, um, open data formats, which are HCAL, uh, HCARD, um, and rel.star, or just uh, HTML5 data attributes as well, and semantic elements, instead of putting everything in divs. Uh, so basically, go through the content, read it, so add some structure or, or some editorial to it and decide what you want to do with it rather than just sort of throwing it in there. Um, this enables you to actually go back and interpret things better. So in this last one, you had all these numbers here sitting in this paragraph. And they're actually really fascinating numbers, but most people aren't going to actually read that. It's a real chore. Um, so why don't we just put it into a chart or a, in, into a, a table? And all of a sudden, that makes a lot more sense to me. I can actually digest that much faster. Uh, now that it's in a table, we can make a graph and visualize this. That's even easier to digest now, and the content means more to me. Uh, this goes back to images of applications. If you want to do these quickly, there's Google Charts, uh, which is a, a convenient little web service. You just basically send the data to tell the chart you want, and it'll spit an image back. Um, really easy to use. And then, of course, getting back to the um, um, infographics. Um, you can actually, again, using HTML, CSS, and SVG, start to actually take that data and manipulate it, you know, I into actual things that are more interpretive and people can actually better understand quickly. Um, and that would still be data underneath. And this allows you to do things like this. So you can have it here, and then. You know, you've got the, the article, and that looks fine on the iPhone. And then you move it to the iPad, and you can change that layout. And, you know, the content's still the same, generally, but, you know, you different layout. And you can oh, move it to the desktop, and there, actually, we've got Flash, and we only have the video in Flash format, so we'll offer it there as well. And um, this actually presents a really interesting opportunity when you can start to move your content around this way. It sounds dumb. This is a quote from Tom Coates. Uh, but I can't tell you how often I'd really like the articles online to have a download as PDF or EPUB option. Well, that's actually one more context. And um, whether it's PDF, EPUB, could even be an, a PhoneGap app. You quickly wrap up your content into an application, and then users could actually um, go and, and actually download or buy that. And all this convenience actually has value. And this is really, really, really important. Um, this is an article from Scott Jensen. Uh, he's ex-Google. He's now at Frog. And um, he wrote a great article. You can find it through that, that short string um, about all the coming devices and all the diversity that, that's still to come. And we need, we need to find ways to deal with this. this is what I've kind of talked about here is just one way. I'm probably wrong in, in several areas. But we need to start finding ways of dealing with this diversity rather than writing for one context. Um, it's not necessary to change, and um, survival is not mandatory either.
Thank you. Any questions? Okay. No questions. Fantastic.